in the corner. Anyhow, okay, so we could begin now. So we're up to session three, which I've called Wealth, Patronage, and Collecting in the 15th century. And the points I'm going to emphasize, which I have been leading up to and preparing the ground for, is that the material wealth of the upper classes due to the explosion in trade uh, in the Mediterranean and ultimately the role that the Italian city-states had in, in the center of trade between not just Italy, but Northern Europe and the Ottoman Empire and, and uh, realms of the world to the east of the Ottomans. Uh, that material well-being was the support layer for producing a tremendous uh, growth in uh, collecting and graphic art production because the audience for purchasing, the audience for sponsoring, the audience for patronizing uh, art was there. And if there's probably a single greatest reason that Renaissance art takes on a form uh, that looks different than medieval art, it's the fact that with Roman models and Greek models before their eyes, they can now support, financially support the production of pieces that look like the ancient world. So the old schools, the old art forms come back into being. So we begin to see uh, realistic painting, representational painting, for instance, on a model that was missing in, in Western Europe, certainly, in, in the Middle Ages. And did someone have a problem? I would say somebody's having a problem hearing, and I would say, turn your volume up. Lou, mine's all the way at, mass, at max, and I'm having trouble hearing you today too, more so Ooh. than usual. Okay, then I'll tell you what, I'm glad you mentioned this. Let me see if, if my own volume. Audio settings. I'm going to push my volume up. Does that sound better? Yes, actually, it does. OK. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. Anyhow, so uh, back to our Italian city-states. Uh, the sources of patronage, of course, were in the banking centers, the cities that, that uh, sponsored trade to the Middle East and funded trade. So Florence, Genoa, Venice, uh, Pisa, all the cities of North Central Italy that, that really took place in the financial activity of the period were the art centers as well. Rome to a lesser degree, but Rome had the papacy and the papacy was one of the great dispensers of patronage in the period. But I should add that the papacy, the Vatican, was in the control of the leading families of Italy at this point in time. So this is the point when the Medici and the Gonzagas and the Estes and the Malatestas and the Sforzas were vying to get cardinal hats for nephews and, and eventually to see if they could get elected to the papacy and, and with tremendous uh, if you will, favoritism paid to the family and, and which would only increase the wealth of the family tremendously. So there were, were eminent commercial and banking families in all of these cities. Uh, the most famous, the Bardi, the Medici, the Strozzi, the Ruccioli, 
all funding trade. And then there were the, the urban courts in Milan, the, the Sconti family and the Sforza family, in, in Mantua, the Gonzagas, which we'll talk about, in fact, at the, the bottom of this slide. That's a fresco from uh, the uh, bridal chamber in the uh, Gonzaga Palace in, in, in Mantua, done by Mantegna. And we'll look at both Mantegna and that room in some detail later on. This is uh, one of those relationships where an artist was almost lifelong. I think Mantegna spent 19 years in the service of the Gonzagas. But there were the Ferraras uh, in Ferrara, there were the Estes in Ferrara, there were the Malatestas in, in Rimini, uh, the Montrefelta in, in Urbino, who we're going to look at in some detail. Then in Rome, the papal families, the significant players in Rome, the Colonna, the Farnese, the Orsini, the Medici again, since they had their, their paw prints everywhere in Italy, the Borgias, who managed to capture a papacy. And and some of these urban courts, as we'll see, uh, the people of influence and power were not so much bankers as the military figures who led the armies in the internecine wars among the city-states in this period. But the, the large point, though, is that a patronage of literature, patronage of art, is now sponsored by both civic and commercial interests, not just by monastic and church entities. So we talked about the civic presence uh, when we looked at the Carlo Crivelli painting and how a, a small town like Ascoli Piceno could pay a major artist to, to promote the city, to be the booster of the city. Anyhow, as I said, on the bottom of the slide, you see this wonderful, uh, wall painting of the Gonzagas. And of course, in, in these sorts of patronized family uh, productions, the figures posing are the actual people of the family. So an artist would spend lots of time around the court and, and to the degree that they could achieve this level of verisimilitude. Um, to that degree, the reputations were made. Renaissance politics. The Italian city-states were relatively independent, but were constantly shifting alliances as they tried to maintain their position in, in a world dominated by the three great international powers, which were the papacy, the Holy Roman Empire to the north, the, the German king, if you will, and France. And what the city-states would do is play one off against the other. So there were, there were all these shifting uh, agreements. There were, there, there were shifting alliances. A city like Milan, uh, so close to the Holy Roman Empire, would, would bring in France as an ally to, to counterbalance uh, the, the imperial presence in the city. And you often had different families within a given city. This is why there were civil war in places like Florence. You had families that, that aligned with the Holy Roman Empire and, and the emperor, and there were families that allied with the Pope and, and its rivalry with the empire. And, and so, so you, you got inter urban and intra-urban politics uh, creating rivalries and, and creating an atmosphere in which the statement, the pronouncement of one's wealth, the impression that one could give of power, of influence, of significance uh, had, had political consequences. The Italian Wars of the Renaissance, as I mentioned in that second paragraph, which on one hand bequeath us uh, Niccolo Machiavelli and that, that political realpolitik 
of his, that 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 cold-eyed vision of the way politics really works. Uh, this world spawns two new social roles that are characteristic of the period. One, we've been talking about the banking families that could fund the wars, and two, the mercenaries, the condottieri, that would execute them. Power and wealth accrued to both functions. So, and a figure like, and 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 here we'll turn to um, a prime example, uh, Federico da Montefeltro, the the Duke of Urbino. If you've never visited Urbino in in the Marche, it's not exactly near anything, but it's one of the the glorious cities of north central Italy. Uh, he's the perfect poster child for what we're dealing with here. Because on one hand, he's educated as a humanist from childhood up. Uh, Vittorino de Feltre was his teacher. He is a patron of uh, humanists. And we see the, the portrait on the right side of this slide. It's the Duke with a Cristoforo Landino, a noted translator and humanist, in a portrait done by Botticelli. And of course, we have to show off a Turkish carpet uh, out the window just to make it clear that these are people of wealth and significance. And here is his uh, ducal palace, which is a, uh, a world heritage site right now. And, and it's a museum of, of the first order, if you've never had a chance. He makes his money as a warrior, he's a significant player, a condottiero, in the service of the Sforzas in Milan, of the city of Florence, the Republic of Florence, and of the King of Naples. He's, his services are on demand. He accrues a huge fortune, and it funded this elegant lifestyle. And remember the slide we saw of him Last week, with him, uh, Montefeltro, the Duke, and his son are studying in one of his studiolos. And we're going to look at the studiolos in the, in the next few slides. He's a wealthy patron of the arts. He's a collector. He's a student of the humanities. And, and collecting, this is the age in which we first see private collectors of art that rival institutional collecting the way that we think of 19th and early 20th century figures like J.P. Morgan and Frick and, and whomever with housefuls of artifacts uh, from the ancient world, from the medieval world, from the Renaissance world, artifacts that we really regard as museum pieces that, that should be bequeathed to the human race but are in the hands of collectors. Commissions were paid. The bread and butter of some of the most famous artists and artworks of the period were based on uh, commissions for the portraits of the patrons. So this is the great age of portrait painting. And here is the Duke again uh, and his second wife, who is Battista Sforza. And who does he get to do the portraits? But Piero della Francesca, let's go to the top. Let's, let's get the, the Tuscan painter of the age to do our, our portraits. Why not? Uh, I mentioned that the Ducal Palace is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and is home to a dizzy assortment of collectibles from the Duke's collection. Uh, on the lower part of the slide, I've shown, uh, this is one of two ideal cities, La Città Ideale by Fra Carnavale. Uh, I forget who the other one's by, but there are two of these in the palace. And you get the humanist ideal for the classical proportion of the ancient world. You, you are meant to think that you're in some place that is a kind of fantasy cross between ancient Rome and um, the newer Renaissance values of that reflect ancient Greece as well as 
ancient Rome, a building that looks like a cross between an opera house and the Colosseum. Uh, we have uh, triumphal arches that are not exactly triumphal arches. Everything is either octagonal or on the square or on the circle. And it's all about proportion. It's all about balance. It's all about the sensibility uh, that we get to from, from revitalizing ancient art, Greek and, and, and Roman ancient art. At Urbino, there is one of two studiolos uh, that he has, the Duke has constructed, one in that, the Urbino Palace, and the other one in the uh, Palace at Gubbio that he controls for a period of time, which is in Umbria, another city worth taking a trip to. The Gubbio Studiolo, however, is in the Metropolitan Museum, which is the one I was pointing to last week, and we'll take a look at some of it again in the upcoming slides. In the Urbino Studiolo, besides the elaborate marquetry, the intarsio uh, woodwork along, along the bottom tier of, of the room. The, these rooms are actually fairly small. They're, they're like 15 by 15 kind of thing because they're meant to be the little studies for, for private reflection, for reading uh, one's library. Uh, but above the upper tier, he has major paintings by major artists of a, a who's who of intellectual history dating back to the classical period and pushing right up through the Renaissance itself. So we get these elaborate portraits. I'll zoom in and we can look at a, a couple of them. We get these elaborate portraits and here, let me get to the other side of uh, people like Homer, Plato, Aristotle, Cicero, Virgil. There are church fathers, Augustine and Jerome are in the pantheon here. There are medieval philosophers. Aquinas is up here. Dun Scotus, the great Franciscan uh, epistemologist is up here. There are the Renaissance giants, Petrarca and Dante. There are the major contemporary humanists that we've been talking about. So Bessarion, the great Greek scholar, Vittorino da Feltre, uh, the great educator, are up here. Everyone uh, has his moment in the sun. He wants to associate himself. Here is this man of war, this, this Renaissance man who does it all, who wants to be associated with the grand tradition as they now see it. The intarsia work is just overwhelmingly uh, magnificent. The woodwork is all trompe l'oeil illusion, but done in wood. We know how the painters do it in the naves of churches and the like, but here you have objects, you have, here, let me zoom in a little bit. You have objects, you have vistas, uh, you have uh, three dimensions so that you think you're looking at a bench. You think doors are opening up into interior space. Um, and the objects themselves, the tr they're treasures of a proud, well-educated and accomplished patron of the humanist curriculum. They're musical and scientific instruments. There are leather bound books done in trompe l'oeil woodwork. There's a lectern and a writing desk. There are exotic birds. There's armor here. We have the high end. The armor itself would have been a work of art. Here is a work of art about the work of art. When you go, if you go to the uh, armor exhibit at the Metropolitan Museum, much of that is show armor. Nobody actually fought in those things. They, they, they were collector's items. Uh, people dressed up in them for their equestrian statues. And here you have this great condottiero showing off weaponry 
armor and weaponry, and and it itself is done in another medium. Uh, this this trompe l'oeil woodwork. There's a portrait of the Duke in the place. That's trompe l'oeil. It's a who's who of uh, intellectual history and 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 Renaissance history. Uh, this is from uh, the Metropolitan. Here is the main room. Uh, that's off the medieval area of the Studiolo of Gubbio in uh, the Met. On the right, I've shown this little lectern here. Let me again zoom and made a focus on it because oh, on the left here, here's a cabinet with books hanging. Um, and books jumbled. But I made a point of this lectern because if we zoom in even closer, there's actually a book on the lectern with this Trump Loy effect of, of manuscript writing on in the book on the lectern. If you can imagine the um, the time and and the commission and the quality of, of work that this required and, and the rewards that would have had to have been paid artists of, of this order. Um, now if somebody had asked the question, which actually costs more, <laughs> the, the, art, the artifacts, the native artifacts or the representations? I think in this case, probably the, uh, the intarsio costs more to produce. And then I think this is my last slide of the of the uh, woodwork. Here are some of the musical instruments. Again, this is at the Met. Uh, I love these angled open doors. They're just amazing. I didn't even know what this is. I guess it's a drum. It looks like a drum. Uh, an hourglass, a compass, a lute. And then uh, organ pipes, a little kind of spinet organ of some kind. The musicians, Jeff will have to tell us what this is. Um, and look at the, the, the pediment work underneath. Just, just amazing. So this is a world where this is affordable to somebody who's spectacularly wealthy. The point is this is a world it isn't that people woke up one day and said, let's produce high-end art of this quality. It's that a world got rich in certain places. And, 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 of, and of course, when a world gets rich, there is this tremendous discrepancy between the wealthy and everyone else and the super wealthy uh, form a foundation that can afford to cultivate art of this order. Artists will achieve this just like, just like in ancient Greece in the, in the, in the vase painting and, and the statuary and the Parthenon, for goodness sake. It will be afforded when there is a place that can pay for it. But chicken and egg, the money has to be there first before the intellectual and artistic capacity follows it. Anyhow, back to collecting. There were several figures uh, often involved in the church, uh, but also connected to families whose wealth was based in the, 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 the wars of the uh, region, like the Gonzagas. Uh, there were several representatives of both worlds who were famed for their collecting. So I picked one. I pick a couple as we go through. And Francesco Gonzaga in the 15th century is certainly one of these. Uh, whoops. He's a lifelong churchman. We get the sense he's not very religious when you when you you look at his obsessions and and his ups. His hobbies and obsessions are all about wealth. He was the Cardinal Bishop of Mantova. Uh, 
he leads a totally secular life, but he's an eminent collector and patron of the arts. We have a copy of his will, and in it, there are listed over 500 gems, intaglios, and cameos, and a chronicle, which this excerpt comes from, described his ceremonial entrance to Bologna once when he was on a civic mission. He came with a fine entourage of retainers and priests. There were around 80 horses in his retinue. He had with him more than 300 lira worth of ornate silverware and large numbers of hangings of Aris style fine tapestry worked in silk and gold, estimated at a value of more than 10,000 ducats. So somebody was impressed. And when I say he left over 500 gems, that doesn't mean he had some nice rings in the cupboard. It means he was collecting things like um, this, this Roman artifact, the Felix gem, which is now in the Ashmolean at Oxford, uh, carved gems from the Roman and Hellenistic periods. His portraits, here are two by Montaigne, one when he was a boy, I told you the Montaigne, Montaigne hung around the Gonzagas for a couple of decades. And here he is when he, he becomes a uh, cardinal itself. Uh, portrait medals in the period. Now this was based on the fact that that Roman, high-end Roman source material was very collectible in the period. And so notable people decided, wealthy families decided that they would get major sculptors, the studios of major sculptors, to produce this, what I call faux coinage. We can put ourselves on these collectible coins the same way that uh, Alexander or Augustus or Cleopatra uh, could be on, on coins that were actually used as exchange. These were not so much used as exchange, but as, as reference collectibles. So uh, from Ferrara, Leonello Veste is on a great number. And here's the uh, front and the, the reverse of the coin. Uh, I love this one from Malatesta in Rimini, Sigismondo Pandolfo Malatesta. And you can see the quality of the work. Uh, these are major and fairly accurate, where we presume, portraits of, of the people involved. The Sultan contracts with workmen from Italy um, for all sorts of things. And we'll talk about this further as we go along. Um, for uh, cannon building, for uh, portraits, even though you know he's Muslim, and the idea of of representations of people is is much against Islamic uh, protocol and tradition, you'll find uh, the sultans of this period uh, enjoyed using the best of Western art and Western art techniques and incorporating some of them into Ottoman techniques. There was a lot of influence in both directions. Here is uh, Cecilia Gonzaga, another one of the Gonzaga family. Here's Cosimo de' Medici, the, 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 the great early uh, sponsor of the family, the, the grandfather, if you will. And here's a humanist. Here's the Feltre again. Uh, I don't know whether he could have afforded to sponsor this himself or a patron of his, of which there were many, um, decided to mint an image of him in honor of his significance. This Amata Feltro might have been the one who uh, sponsored this. Jewelry. Venetians were famous for the production of jewelry, but in every one of the cities, uh, you would have found thriving industry and producing jewelry for men and jewelry for women. I've used women's portraits in this regard. Uh, 
because the sensational use of this this um, Botticelli on the left of Simonetta Vespucci, portrait of a young woman. He always reminds me of Peter Max. Remember him back in the 60s and 70s, these sort of uh, pretty cartoony versions of people. But look at look at these astonishing uh, pearls that are woven through the young woman's head. The idea that you would have yourself presented to the world uh, with this show of spectacular wealth. Portrait of Maria Portinari of Hans Memling, uh, Northern Europe. There's a woman tastefully in black. She's from the North. She's got her hands in the medieval prayer pose. Uh, so she's she's dutifully observant. Uh, and take away the necklace and you could be looking at a nun, but get a load of the necklace. Uh, Sister Mary Ignatius was not wearing this when I was in the fifth grade. I can guarantee that. Uh, just astonishing work. And it's the sort of thing, this is long before Antiques Roadshow, folks. A portrait of Marie de' Medici. Uh, again, tasteful, sort of in French style as the Medici like to uh, mimic and were heavily influenced by. Tuscan food in this period, because of the Medici uh, alliance with the French, uh, the cuisine of, of Tuscany developed many, many uh, French touches in this period. But again, look at Marie's work, look at the collar, look at, I guess, that is that a tiara? I don't know what you would call the, the little headpiece there. Um, just astonishing work. And of course, and of course, we're we're looking at two things. We're looking at a painter who could vividly capture the sense of person who's showing off in, in the picture. The depth you get, you get a, set, a sense of the depth of, of personality. Maria Portinari looks like she is someone to contend with, as does uh, Marie de Medici. But but within the painting, there is the artwork of the jeweler and the dressmaker. So this kind of layered achievement, layer upon layer of, of achievement. Um, Julian asked if I could make some reference to music. Uh, I probably could because polyphony took off in this period. I can't say that I know enough about it to make the point, but there were court sponsored musicians. This is the age when, when modal music gets much more complex and, and polyphon polyphonic or orchestrated music which, which is the entree to what we think of as or European orchestral music uh, in the early modern period is established at courts in this period. Musical instruments are, are being developed, uh, all forms of lutes, all forms of wind instruments are developing in this period. And the use of voices, uh, when, whenever you you hear a high a papal high mass, for instance, for Christmas or Easter, uh, what they're singing is essentially uh, the earliest of it would be music from the 15th century. But you're listening to music that was probably produced between the 15th and 17th centuries. Uh, typically, when you listen to the polyphony that was established in courts like Rome in in this period, cameo art. So ancient cameos, the, the Romans had quite a tradition of producing these carved cameos out of, out of materials like sardonyx. And so the collecting of Roman sources uh, became the model for the collecting of modern Renaissance 
versions based on the iconography of the Roman models. So here are some that were ancient that were collected in the, in the period. So from the Medici collection, the, the so-called Seal of Nero, uh, I guess, is this in the Palazzo Medici now? I'm not sure where, where all these things are housed right now. Apollo, Marcius, and, and Olympus. Uh, again, glorious work collected by the Medici family. Can you imagine what it cost them? Uh, who did they buy it from? Where was this stuff in between? God only knows. That's, I'm sure there are jewelry historians who write extensive uh, manuscripts on, on just topics like that, monographs on topics like that. The Gonzaga cameo of uh, anybody's guess, they suggested, since it's Hellenistic, that this might be a model for Alexander. It's certainly a pose based on Alexander. And who would the woman be in this, this case if it were Alexander? Uh, the Blacas cameo of Augustus, a very famous uh, view of the early Augustus. And this work, the Roman world was wealthy. The Roman world supported this. We don't see it for 12 centuries, but then suddenly the Mediterranean Italian trade world is sufficiently wealthy again to produce these kinds of things again. So it's, it's not happenstantial that we see this. Um, modern cameos, modern in the sense that the Renaissance produced these. So it's a portrait cameo of Cosimo uh, de' Medici, Eleanor of Toledo and their children. Let's get the whole family involved in a cameo. And next to it, oh, I lost my vision, is a so-called blackamoor. This is the age of discovery. Again, people are uh, in trade contact with, with the Near East and North Africa. Here is a, a, an homage to that, a, a, an African woman uh, immortalized on a, on a cameo done in the early 16th century by, they believe, Girolamo Miseroni, who was a well-known cameo artist. Uh, tapestries, it's too bad that they do fade over time, but you've got these collections. Most of these were done, they were inspired by work done, you know, Ara style in, uh, uh, in the Flemish section of the Netherlands. Uh, these are called the Devonshire hunting tapestries. There's several of them. I, I just picked a couple. And, and indeed you get this elaborate work. Can you imagine what this looked like when the colors were brilliantly minted? Uh, and of course you always find scenes with the hunting dogs and, and uh, women in, in full regalia and everybody's out there after, in this case, a boar and a bear, or on the right, uh, swans and otters are being held to, hunted down in their dens. There's, there are men on a horseback. And these are just details of these huge tapestries that cover that cover walls and, and were owned by people like Francesco Gonzaga. Manuscripts, you know, the medieval manuscripts were usually, you know, psalm books and missals with, with some elaborate uh, ornamentation in the margins. This now, the so, a so-called black book of hours, meaning the, the, the uh, psalms that would be recited in a monastic setting, of, but this one of Galeazzo Maria Sforza, from the 1470s. Look at the level of elaborate development. Now the 1470s, printing gets invented in 1450. We're gonna talk about this next week. And all the, the books that are actually printed between 14 and 1500 are called incunabula. This is still manuscript work, even the, but the incunabula in the early days of printing, printing, 
of the very early days was still done for a generation or two for the wealthy. So they would, even if they didn't do the lettering by hand, they might print, stamp, print the page and then send it off to the artist for this elaborate uh, artwork, inlays and, and enameling and all sorts of things. So here is a book of ours. What we have in these two pages are on the left, the four evangelists, and on the right, the beginning of the Gospel of John, the, the so-called in the beginning was the word. We'll take a look at it a little more closely. Look at the elaborate representation. We even have angels inspiring them. Uh, we have symbols, uh, the lion, the, the, the uh, bull, the, the various symbols of the evangelist. And on the right, if you look closely, I don't know how good you are at uh, making up the lettering of, of this Renaissance script, this is the I, so it's I N. That's it. so the in principio erat verbum. At verbum erat apud dei deum, etc. And the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. Uh, how long did it take to uh, illuminate this? Look at the. with the scroll work involved in this. I mean, and this is not done in a monastery anymore. So apparently you still had studios of illuminators where there's money, there are people who will come to do the work. Anyhow, artists were for hire. So often painting was done by contract. So if, if the person didn't have a long-term relationship with a court or a particular patron, you might engage somebody for a particular piece. So since I had um, access to this contract between Domenico Ghirlandaio, the artist, and the prior of the Ospedali degli Innocenti in, in, in Florence, the, the Hospital of the Innocents in Florence, for this painting, the Adoration of the Magi, which is done in 1488. And I'll talk about it in a second. We'll, look, we'll come back and look at it a little more closely, but I want to look at the contract with you. Uh, so quoted from the contract, and he is to color. So this is the prior speaking here and uh, writing here, and he's to color and paint the said panel, all with his own hand. None of this, you know, do the cartoon and hand it off to the students, Bozo. We want, I'm paying for the man. So we want this done in his own hand, in the manner shown in the drawing on paper. So you gave me a little cartoon, you sketched it out what it was gonna be, with those figures and in that manner shown in it. And in every particular, according to what I, Fra Bernardo, think best, not departing from the manner and composition of the said drawing. And he must color the panel at his own expense with good colors and with powdered gold as such ornaments as demanded with any other expense incurred on the same panel. And the blue, we got a lot of blue going on over here. We got the virgin in the middle, so it's always going to be blue. Uh, and the blue must be ultramarine of the value of about four florins the ounce. So there's all kinds of level of materials involved. Hey, I want you using the good ultramarine, which we're going to find out later on comes from lapis lazuli which gets imported from Afghanistan. So I want the good stuff. And I know it costs four florins an ounce, but you're doing it. And he must have made and delivered complete the said panel within 30 months from today. And he must receive as the price of the panel, as here described, 
made at his, that is, the said Domenico's expense throughout, 115 large florins. That's a good price. If it seems to me, the above said Fra Bernardo, that it is worth it. I'd better be impressed at the end of this. And I can go to whomever I think best for an opinion on its value or workmanship. And if it does not seem to me worth the stated price, he shall receive as much less as I, Fra Bernardo, think right. Okay, I'm the I'm the judge and I can take it to, you know, other good art estimators and we'll take it on the Antiques Roadshow and we'll see what they say. And he must, within the terms of the agreement, paint the predella, you know, the bottom, like below the altar, of the said panel, as I, Fra Bernardo, think good. By the way, in, in several contracts from this period, they also specified directions for the frames, if they were pa oil paintings, for instance. The frames sometimes cost as much as the painting. And if Domenico has not delivered the panel within the above said period of time, he would be liable uh, to a penalty of 15 large florins. And correspondingly, if Messer Francesco does not keep to the above said monthly payment, he will be liable to a penalty of the whole amount. That is, once the panel is finished, he will have to pay complete and full the balance of the sum due. So on my side, I got to pay you the whole bit, okay? And, and here we go. So you can see, we want the good blues and we want gold wherever and like in halos and things like this. If you got to use real gold, if you got to use real gold, you got to use real gold. So let's not mess around here. Um, another painting by contract, another contract. So this is in regard to the Strozzi Chapel and Santa Maria Novella in Florence, uh, which is done by Filippino Lippi. So we have two Filippos, Filippo Lippi, the artist, and Filippo Strozzi, the patron, uh, negotiate. And the vault, there shall be four figures, either doctors of the church, evangelists, or others according to the choice of the said Strozzi, and they shall be painted with blue and with gold as richly as possible. They always specify the blue and the gold. The rest of the vault shall be a fine ultramarine blue worth at least four large gold florins an ounce. And the ribs of the vault, capitals of the pilasters and cornices shall be adorned with as much gold as is necessary. And in every place where it is needed, gold, pure gold, and every other fine and perfect color shall be used. And the said Filippo di Filippo promises the said Strozzi to work in fresco according to the practice of good masters. Okay? According to, to what is the accepted common practice. And with all possible diligence, and again, and all by his own hand, especially the figures. We're not putting the students on this. And it is agreed that the said Filippo di Filippo shall have for the work, that is to say the painting, colors including blue pigment, scaffolding, lime for plaster, and all else so that the said Strozzi will be required to meet no other expenses. They are craftspeople. They were regarded as hired guns. Our concept of artists, which proceeds out of sort of that mystical sense of, of inspired moments that we get out of the 19th century. This is, this is the artist as a craftsman, not as sort of the independent genius as, as we uh, in our um, own period since the 19th century. In Florence, the painters belonged to the, to the guild and they were paid through the guild. They had to pay their dues and payment came to the guild. There was like an intermediary. And the guild they belonged to were the guild of doctors and apothecaries. 
Orte de Medici et Speciali. They are the pharmacists because the many of the pigments early in the period were supplied by the pharmacies, the apothecaries. While sculptors were members of the masters of stone and wood, the maestri di pietra e di legname. So let's take a picture at the Strozzi Chapel. So these figures had to be done by Lippi himself, according to the contract. Uh, supplies, art supplies. Venice was very much in the uh, key position when it came to uh, sourcing art supplies. The trade empire of Venice supported uh, material for glass makers, painters, jewelers, manuscript illuminators, and textile dyers. There was uh, an institution that got developed in the 15th century called the, it still exists actually, the Vende Colori. Uh, it's it's a, um, the word is an amalgam of uh, color sellers. So for supplying foundation pigments for art, in these new stores, there were these new roles, these new people who, who became known as Vendecolori. And they engaged in international importing. You wanna buy your colors, you go to the uh, one of the Vendecolori. The color quality and brightness depended on affordability. This is why some things were very expensive and other things were less so. And remember, oil oils don't get produced really until, uh, early 15th century. There is, you know, tempera before that. Pigments made from earths and organic material like plants or flowers or berries. Those were relatively cheap, but anything that's metal-based or mineral-based, those pigments are gonna be more expensive. So for instance, lead was used to make white and red, tin or orpiment for yellow, Orpiment was one of these new imported uh, minerals. Azurite for blue, malachite for green. Uh, and if you've ever visited a 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th century uh, art studio, uh, you can go to the house of Rembrandt in Amsterdam, for instance, and they actually, in his studio, every hour or two, have a demonstration. You'll see a lot of like high school and elementary school students being taken by their teachers for a tour. And, and there is, uh, someone will come and actually grind some mineral for a color and show you how it was done. But this was done, you buy the materials and then you do your own grinding. And it was very, you know, the preparation of your palette was 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 uh, quite involved. A supplier needed access to ancient, excuse me, Asian markets to acquire the rarer and very best pigments. And as I said before, the only source for ultramarine was lapis lazuli from Afghanistan. Gold, silver, and tin leaf were used in pieces made for wealthy clients or important churches. And later on, Renaissance oil painters were able to reproduce some of these metallic effects using oils, but precious materials were sometimes required uh, for by the patrons. Um, so now on the right, as an example, I picked the painting called The Feast of the Gods which was done, believe it or not, both by, uh, it was a collaboration, somebody was at it first, and Giovanni Bellini begins, Titian finishes, and I picked it both because it's famous for its use of color, and it's in this period when they had access to really vivid coloration. 
that they began, in some cases, Bellini certainly did this, and Titian did this, obviously. Uh, they began to use uh, color fields to delineate objects. So there was less of the actual drawn line edge to a body. It was more field uh, of color delineation of individual objects and people and things. And, and this gives you a suggestion. I mean, look at the blues, look at the greens, look at, look at the, the bowl itself. So just, you know, astonishing levels of detail. And of course, look at the theme. It's a classical theme, not a Christian theme. It's the Feast of the Gods. Let's have all the Olympians up here having a uh, picnic. Uh, this painting, and one of the reasons I picked it is that it, in 1985, they did x-rays and all kinds of stuff on this. And, and so extensive pigment analysis. The painters use common pigments, uh, natural ultramarine, lead tin yellow, malachite, verdigris, and vermilion, but they also included some of the rare novelties, orpiment and realgar, another, another exotic source of color. So now in talking about the relationship uh, between patrons and, and uh, the artists, we have, again, because we've been looking at the Gonzagas fairly closely. Uh, I, I want to look at an exchange of letters between Montaigne um, and, and uh, Lodovico Gonzaga. Montaigne, I should warn you right off the bat, was known to be something of a uh, complainer. And, and a lot of his letters always have kind of a harsh tone. Uh, Gonzaga, on the other hand, seems to be this kind of elegant uh, man of peace. Let's, uh, let's not have a fight here. Letter from Ludovico Gonzaga to Andrea Mantegna in 1458. Uh, Mr. Luca Talia Pietra has described how great is your desire to enter our service. It pleases us greatly to know this and we received it gladly. And so that you may know at once our good will towards you we advise you that our own intention is to reserve for you in good faith, everything which we have promised you in our letters at other times. And still more, that is to say 15 ducats a month, a provision of rooms where you can live with your family, enough food each year to feed six and enough firewood for your use. Do not have the slightest doubt about all this. And so that you may not incur any expense in bringing your family here. I think he was in Pisa at the time. We are happy to promise that at the time you want to come, we shall send down a small ship at our expense to move you and your household and bring you here so that it will not cost you anything. Okay. He stays with them for 19 years. And here is... He a fresco scene of Ludovico and his son done in a location that I will show you in the next slide. Here's a letter from Montaigne back to Gonzaga, 19 years later. I have been in great hope, complaining. I've been in great hope, increasing all the time I have served your excellency, which is nearly 19 years, and seeing the great remuneration of property, houses, and other assets which have been lavished on your servants. Okay, you paid other people like lots of nice stuff. I meanwhile still wait deservingly and neglected. It is five years since your lordship promised to pay me with that property, he promised him a house, which I do not reckon a good sign. It's been five years. I hope that in that time, your excellency would have paid me with the said possession. That is the 800 ducats and would have helped me further to pay the 600 ducats as your excellency promised. And I still had hope that you would help me build the house as was promised. Um, he wound up getting all of this and Ludovico said, dear boy, you know, don't lose it. <laughs> we'll get there. 
And um, the fresco from the previous slide and the fresco from the first slide on the family court of the Gonzagas uh, and Mantua, um all come from this one place, the Camera degli Sposi, the bridal chamber at the Ducal Palace of Mantova. And here you see, you know, this must have been quite a glorious room when everything was still intact and there was no damage, surrounded by family frescoes done by the eminent Andrea Mantegna, one of the great painters of the moment, uh, all in one chamber. Then there is the case of the celebrity artist. Uh, can we get Leonardo? My goodness. So a letter from Isabella Deste to Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, this comes from 1504, the first letter. Hearing that you are staying and Florence, we have conceived the hope that something we have long desired might come true to have something by your hand. We would love to have a Leonardo. When you were here and drew our portrait in charcoal, this is it, it's still intact, Isabella d'Este. You promised one day to do it in color. By the way, this in color uh, has been found in a private collection in Switzerland in the year like 2013, but it's disputed. They think it might be a forgery. Anyhow, I should mention that. But it, it's actually as if he took this as the model and then, and then did a colorized version. But because this would be almost impossible since it would be inconvenient for you to move here, we beg you to keep your good faith with us by substituting for our portrait another figure even more acceptable to us, that is to do a youthful Christ of about 12 years old, which would be the age he was when he disputed with the doctors in the temple and executed with that sweetness and, and soft ethereal charm, which is the peculiar excellence of your art, the sfumato, the Mona Lisa. If we are gratified by you in this strong desire of ours, you shall know that beyond the payment, which you yourself shall fix, you tell us, we shall remain so obliged to you that we shall think of nothing else but to do you good service. And from this very moment, we offer ourselves to act at your convenience and pleasure. Expecting a favorable reply, we offer ourselves to do all your pleasure. Then in October of the same year, she writes again. Some months ago, we wrote to you that we wanted to have a young Christ about 12 years old by your hand. You have replied through uh, Mr. Angelo Tavaglia that you would do this gladly, but owing to the many commission works which you, uh, you have on your hands, we doubt whether you have remembered ours. Wherefore, it has occurred to us to send you these few lines begging you that when you were tired of the Florentine historical theme, you will turn to doing this little figure for us by way of recreation. Just jot it down, like one of those little Picasso line drawings, which will be doing us a very gracious service and a benefit to yourself. I never knew whether they got anything for that. Anyhow, let's move to the uh, primo family of them all, the Medici, and look at this great series that was commissioned by Piero de Cosimo, who's the son of the great uh, Cosimo. And, and, and Piero's also, uh, the father of Lorenzo, you magnifico. And he commissions Benozzo Gazzoli in 1459 to do this chapel in the Medici, uh, the Palazzo Medici. The spectacular level of craftsmanship with the depiction of jewels, fabrics, harnesses was a very conscious and deliberate proclamation of the power and significance of the Medici. This is just one of the walls involved. And we're gonna go through a number of these figures. Here's an idealized version of, of Lorenzo. And, and uh, we have Piero on his horse over here and the uh, elder Cosimo. Um, so 
there is, if you will, a, a, an overview, a religious theme, um, as you often would find, you know, in, in Renaissance art that serves as the excuse to do the painting. Let's, let's do it in the, in the tradition of a religious theme. So we'll have the Magi, the three Magi coming to, and remember who the Magi were. They were these grandees from the East, from Persia, who following the star to Bethlehem come to bring the magnificence of Asia to the, to the Christ child in honor of the Christ child. The, the, we three kings of Orient are, right? Uh, so it was, it was the parallel to the Magi that flattered the Medici. Here, you'll be the three kings from the Orient. You will come with your frankincense and myrrh. So it's an utterly secular message, ultimately. The procession depicts several members of the Medici family. Also, there are Byzantine dignitaries in the painting who attended the Council of Florence in 1438, the one that brought the Greeks to beg for support against the Turks. Uh, and the whole council was bankrolled by the Medici. So here they go. The Medici and the imperial entourage are therefore placed in majestic equivalents. We have the Eastern Emperor and we have Piero de Medici. The sumptuousness of the detail includes leaves of gold that would shine in dim candlelight because the chapel would be relatively dim. So here again, we have the East Wall, a hunting scene, at the, at the uh, obligatory hunting scene. We have uh, Castelli, Tuscan Castelli, and we have several figures in this pack who are recognizable. And we'll look at a couple of them in subsequent slides. So from different walls, West Wall, South Wall, East Wall, we have the Magi themselves. So we have Melchior, here's Melchior. And this elderly figure who is Melchior, the, the Magus, the magician, is a either modeled on the Patriarch of Constantinople, scholars aren't sure, or on the Holy Roman Emperor Sigismund both of which would have been fairly flattering associations for the Medici. On the south wall, we have Balthazar, who is the Byzantine emperor, John VIII Paleologos. And here he is riding his white steed. Look at this outfit trimmed in gold. Look at the, look at the harnesses. And, the... and Casper is an idealized version of the boy Lorenzo, who would have been actually only about 11 years old at this time. And there's an, and he's also in um, the fresco as a boy. But here, since he's the heir apparent, let's make him one of the uh, magi in a uh, kind of idealized form. So it doesn't look like we know Lorenzo to look because he hasn't grown that old yet. And that's from the East Wall. And then, uh, lots of the other people. So for instance, we have Cosimo and Piero. He himself is the patron for this painting. We can see the famous Medici features. And here is Lorenzo as a boy and Giuliano, his brother in the entourage. They're not the only uh, siblings in it. We have the three sisters. Nanina, Bianca, and Maria, again, on their white steeds. And then several other recognizable figures. So here, as part of that general panel on the East Wall, are Sigismondo Malatesta of Rimini and Galeazzo Maria Sforza of Milan. Let's have, we are paid the honor of the other uh, significant dukes in Northern Italy coming 
to pay homage to our family gathering. So the, the Malatestas and the Sforzas show up. Here is Castruccio Castracani from Luca. And we know it's him because the family emblem is the, whatever this cat is, it's a leopard or some kind of large cat. The painter himself, Gozzoli, puts himself in it. And we know this is him because it says Opus Benozzi. This is the work of Benozio Gazzoli himself. So I did it, I'm putting myself in. And Gamistos Platon, the Greek Neoplatonic philosopher who was the teacher of Bessarion, who showed up at the council in Florence. And, and so we're gonna surround ourselves with you know, the glories of Greek learning. He was the one of the great Greek scholars of the age. So everybody, everybody comes. Uh, all in in one magnificent work of art. And then finally, a couple of views of um, wealth as it spills into the hands of the commercial bourgeoisie. Uh, so the famous Arnolfini portrait by Jan van Eyck, an early uh, masterpiece. And, and this painting is one of the astonishing works of the age. And it may have been uh, in, as in lieu of a wedding contract because we find it's witnessed in the signature of Jan van Eyck right here, as if he's signing the marriage contract as I'm a witness to this moment in time. So the portrait is of a merchant, Giovanni de Nicolao Arnolfini, who's a merchant representing Italian commercial interests in the North. Okay, so we're up in the Low Countries. So he's doing trade from both places. And he's clearly a man of tremendous wealth. Look at the, you know, the, the ermine and the, the, the fine silks and fabrics of her gown, the ermine trim. Um, the technique is, as with all Van Eyck, the technique is spectacular. The inventive use of perspective. Uh, we'll take a closer look at it in the next slide. The early adoption of, of the use of oil. This is one of the first great oil paintings. The near magical illusionism, this convex mirror in back, which will reflect the entire room in its convexity. Is, is just, the illusion is just astonishing. And of course, the layered symbolism. It's one of the great masterpieces of the early Renaissance. Uh, wealth abounds, sable and ermine trim garments, silk damask doublet, the elaborate gold chandelier, golden brass chandelier, the famous convex mirror, the oranges on the left, here we have some oranges. Um, the edge of an oriental carpet near the bed. So we get here this edge of Turkish carpet. And I love, I love these clogs, these house shoes down here. I also love the drawing, but I love these, these clogs. Um, and the elaborate bed hangings. So here you're now, as early as the 1440s in the Quattrocento, the first half of the 15th century, the accumulation of vast wealth is not just in the province of the aristocracy. The cultural base has broadened and will continue to broaden aggressively in the 16th and 17th centuries. Wealth will be shared across a wide spectrum and 
patronage for art will be everywhere. There, it will not just be nobles and contatieri and the heads of banks. You will get commercial business people. You will get guilds that can afford uh, to sponsor work on the, in their own interest. You, you will get people in every corner of Europe who can sponsor. And of course, here is a close-up of the image of the mirror where we see the whole room in this is astonishing uh, convex reflection and scenes from the gospels surrounding in the mirror. The, the level of detail is just incredible. Anyhow, that this is what I been promising we're going to look at, have the material basis for the Renaissance was as important as, if you will, as the artistic breakthroughs in technique. And that those are only supportable using classical models when the wealth to support them is there. It's a brave new world. And we're going to see the impact next week of printing on this world and, and uh, the impact of Protestantism and the Reformation on this world. And it will be a brave new world. With that, I am going to do two things. I'm going to stop the share and I'm going to remove the pin. And are there questions or comments or? Lou, I was wondering um, whether the progression in, in the sources of wealth and, and the expansion of the wealthier classes, did, did that bring more Jewish families um, into the mix of patrons? Um, yes, actually. In, but they would still keep that familiar um, religious framing to convey um, status? How do you mean? Well, um you were pointing out the Magi, for example, the 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 Medici painting, um, echoing the the Magi, that sort of framing of um, the patron's importance or status, right? Using that kind of um, familiar religious storytelling to convey a, a more secular uh, image. I I don't think that, like the Jewish banking families of the period would have tried to present that kind of public face. You know, there, there was still so much anti-Semitic um, regard in Western Europe that they, while they collected, I'm not so sure that they would have uh, engaged artists to highlight their significance. That would have, that would have been, I think, regarded as dangerous. Okay, yeah, because uh, uh, one of those um, that we were looking at, I, I got an instant impression of of um, sort of campaign advertising, um, if you could make a, a comparison with today. I mean, it had a lot of similar features in terms of messaging. I also thought of social influencers too, because it just really, it screams all of those uh, elements of humanity. That's true. And of course, the Medici did it on steroids because <laughs> they really thought that in the land of the great, they were by far the most significant and they were making that point. Yeah, so it wasn't strictly political. Some of it was, like you say, self-regard. Oh, totally. Yeah, okay. Totally. And and uh, I always like to think of figures like the Duke of Montefeltro as someone who led 
what we would now consider to be a curated life. Ah, yeah. It was, so yeah, ego it was, was in, in other words, there there was no shame in egoism. Right, but it was but it was a kind it wasn't it wasn't a kind of Trumpian egoism. It was No, no, there yeah. is no Trumpian <laughs> egoism other than Trump, but, um, no, but it, was, it was much more it was much more I I myself am the alternate work of art here. I am I am as much scholar as I am soldier. I am a man of taste. I am a man of measure. I'm a man who does homage to the great and the important i know how to honor the things that ought to be honored i'm the man of taste i am you know i'm you look at the, the renaissance man yeah you look at the studio <laughs> in urbino and you say look yeah my own portrait is there but look look at who i honor i'm this insignificant uh you know servant of the great and here they are, and I appreciate them all. Here's my book collection, except the music. <laughs> so yeah. my egotistical rendering of my humility. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Uh, and any anybody else? But it was that was a great point, Diane. Was that Diane who said that? Um, the, the, yeah, absolutely yeah. true too. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I I found those contracts absolutely fascinating in the amount of detail that they. Um, the insight they provided into into the times and what was important to people. Um, and I cracked up when I read um, the suggestion that Leonardo could uh, take a vacation from his work by working for us. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, it does, and, it, and it really showed that uh, for the very wealthy, the, the artist was a craftsman for hire, to be respected and to be admired. But to be hired, you know, I get to dictate the conditions of acceptability. And of yeah, course, the, the delicate balance between flattery and um, assertion and, of, of authority. Yeah. And of course, the, the prior of, of the Hospital of the Innocents in Florence, he was worried because he's it's basically a church purchase and he's a functionary. You know, I don't. What do I know about this? I don't want to be duped. <laughs> exactly, be yeah. Most of the money. Anyhow. Very rich. This is amazing material. I, I really am loving what you're doing here. Well, well thanks. Agreed. Um, yeah, Diane? I totally agree. It's fascinating. And I, I, the detail in the artwork just floors me because I could never do it. <laughs> it's unbelievable what they painted. Yeah, I find the um, I find some of the carving, like the car, the cameo carving and the jewel carving, just. Oh yeah, my cabinet maker one. does that stuff all the time. <laughs> Not. Anyhow, that yeah. that is incredible. It it really is. Um, there was one other thing that jumped up. Oh yeah, so if any, whenever necessary, our repairs and restorations. Do they are they required to you to use the same materials as the original or are newer, more contemporary things deemed appropriate nowadays? I have no idea. That that is an interesting question, though. I'm gonna to have to remember to look that up. Yeah, my guess is of paramount importance is to keep authenticity, but who knows? Exactly. But yet certainly there might there must have been at least some improvements in the material and the um carriers um from yeah, I all these centuries ago yeah, I don't think that, that would be true I, I really don't anyhow let's shut it down for this week um next week as i said we would be talking about the world of printing and the reformation and also of um uh, international exploration and bringing uh, the voyages of discovery into the uh, European theater. And with that, see you next week. Thank, Thank you so much. Have a great week. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Good. Have a good week.